With Dragon Quest Builders 2 out now in North America, many gamers will be wondering how Dragon Quest got thrown into the sandbox genre in the first place, and if the Dragon Quest Builders series is worth playing. What's up creative gamers, I'm Mark and I want to thank you for coming along with me as we explore how Dragon Quest Builders was developed, I'll review the game, and then we'll take a look at the new features for Dragon Quest Builders 2. You may be wondering how it came about to combine the Dragon Quest series with the sandbox genre in the first place, and you'll likely be surprised to discover that despite the similarities, there was actually no involvement by Minecraft developer Mojanga. Let's go back to 2014. Obama was in office and there were only two Spider-Man 2s. Dragon Quest Builders producer Nodiyosha Fujimoto and director Kazuya Nino were fans of the sandbox video games but knew the genre was not popular in Japan where gamers were used to a more structured game style. What's more is that sandbox games usually lacked set objectives which posed an obstacle with their approachability. They wanted to find a way to introduce the genre to Japanese gamers. And what's a good way to push an unfamiliar game style to a new market? Combine it with one of the most popular brands in the entire country, of course. And as such, the idea for Hello Kitty Builders was born. I always liked Minecraft and this is something I wanted to experiment with, a JRPG blended with building mechanics," said Nino in an interview with Variety in 2019. That's where we thought we might be able to make a fun game if we brought in the RPG elements of Dragon Quest and have a story unfold while you also freely build things," said Fujimoto, and the result is what he called the block-building RPG genre. This isn't the first Dragon Quest game to deviate from the style of the main series. There have been many spin-offs, especially in Japan, the purpose of them being to appeal to new gamers and broaden Dragon Quest's audience. If someone played one of the spin-offs and enjoyed it, it might influence them to play another Dragon Quest title. Combining a sandbox framework which allows the player to freely destroy and create anything they can imagine with a structured story-driven RPG would present a set of challenges and take much trial and error for the developers to overcome. According to Nino, the dev team was a smaller one consisting of a few dozen people. 53 names are credited under Business Division 5 in the game's credits, including a few designers from Carabans Inc., a design studio out of Tokyo. However, many more were involved through other divisions. Usually, making a role-playing game fun involves tweaking the various numerical values in the game, said Nino to Forbes in 2016. In this case, we focus solely on what the player experiences. But they found that the sandbox genre inherently has an aspect of not knowing what to do. They needed to find a way to manage the story knowing that every player would be building things differently and at different paces. To solve for this, the game was divided into chapters, even though it was initially planned as an open world adventure. The developers also wanted to add more distinction between areas and felt that if you kept all your materials from one area to the next, the game would become too easy and be less rewarding, which further cemented the chapter format. Each chapter has the goal of rebuilding a city destroyed by the Dragon Lord. The player is given tasks by NPCs to build items and structures to grow each city. Completing these tasks progresses the game, so building and experiencing the story go hand in hand and drive the player forward. Boss battles would be used to separate each chapter. The bosses are accessed by completing required tasks, defeated by using the building skills learned in each chapter, and victory unlocks the next chapter. In order to streamline building structures, blueprints were added, which are diagrams to show players an example of what to build. The player is free to deviate from the blueprints, but they provide further structure to help progress the game. Once you have made the basic structure as instructed by the blueprint, the rest is up to your imagination, said executive producer Yu Miyake at Gamecom in 2016. This allows players to dictate how they experience the game and set their own pace. You could play the game quickly by sticking to the blueprints or take the time to express yourself in your city building. One of the big points of this was to take the sandbox portion of it, and also the RPG portion, and put them together in a way that would appeal to Japanese gamers, to have it lead you through, but you would still be able to do as you please when you play it, said Fujimoto. There have been many imitations of Minecraft since its release in 2011. 
With the decision for DQ Builders visuals to use Minecraft's graphical style, coupled with the fact that Minecraft developer Mojanga was not involved, it would be easy to dismiss Builders as another clone. Nino does acknowledge the obvious similarities to Minecraft, stating, Dragon Quest Builders was of course born out of having experience playing Minecraft. I simply wanted to add quests and drama to the Minecraft world. And in 2016, Fujimoto said, Item and town construction is a major component, so that similarity to Minecraft does exist. Beyond that, it is a story-driven adventure game with many RPG elements, so even though there is some common ground, it is a very different game. He continues that the Dragon Quest series originally had a grid map made up of squares representing the terrain, which lent itself nicely to a 3D world of blocks used in Minecraft. The team decided to develop for the PS4, Vita, and PS3, and to create the game with Sony's Fire Engine due to its compatibility with multiple platforms. Fire Engine has been used for games such as Unravel, Final Fantasy X and X2 HD, and Journey. Since they hadn't made this type of game before, existing tools and middleware would not work for development, so an entire new toolset was created by the program engineer. The game data itself was pretty simple so everyone is able to understand the system, said Nino to Forbes in 2016. We assigned one person per level to implement everything needed. Development focused first on the structure and tools of the game, such as materials and items, and put the story into the game later. And given the connection of the grid-based visuals Fujimoto mentioned, it's fitting that the story of Builders connects to that of the original Dragon Quest as well. One of the most playful and memorable scenes from Dragon Quest was when the boss enemy says, If you join me, I will give you half of the world, after which you must select yes or no, said Fushimoto. We thought, what would happen if you choose the answer that's not expected? The idea stuck, and the plot became if the hero in Dragon Quest 1 were to have taken the deal and the world of Alephgard were consequently left in ruins. The developers loved the fun what-if scenario and alternate storyline and thought this was a great way to show the game truly has a Dragon Quest story. Now the hero is the only one who can build and create and must apply those skills to rebuild four cities. Cantlin, Fimuldar, Cole, and Tantingel. They added a free build mode for those who just want to build without battling time constraints or story elements. There are monsters, but they're there to help you rather than battle you. Multiplayer features, unfortunately, were not included, as the developers wanted to concentrate their efforts on the challenge of combining the two game genres and not bite off more than they could chew. The testing was performed by gamers who hadn't played the other Dragon Quest games with the idea that it would help make the game accessible to all players. Dragon Quest Builders released on January 28, 2016 in Japan alongside a limited edition Vita console. A North American release would follow on October 11, 2016, eventually followed by the Switch version released on February 9, 2018. After the release, Fujimoto did acknowledge there are things they would have liked to have done differently. He points out better monster AI, allowing players to level up and increasing their character stats, more dynamic boss battles, and making the game generally more accessible. Fans liked the game, particularly and unsurprisingly in Japan. Total sales for the title across all regions and hardware stands at approximately 1.24 million as of July 2019 according to VGCharts.com. In Japan, there were contests where people would send in their Dragon Quest Builders creations and Square Enix would rank them. They held a live stream where they explored some of the top selections and announced a winner. In February 2018, another such contest was held called Builders 100 Landscape Contest, The Road to Builders 2. Square Enix selected 100 winners whose creations are included in Dragon Quest Builders 2. With the game's success, could we see the sandbox formula applied to other Square Enix properties? When asked this at PAX West in 2016, Fushimoto stated, We do think that Final Fantasy combined with a sandbox game would be successful, mainly because over here, Final Fantasy is very big. Unsurprisingly, no such game has been confirmed. Although Square Enix was similarly cryptic when asked if there would be a Dragon Quest Builders 2, which is of course now a reality. So there you have the story of an unlikely union of the sandbox genre in the Dragon Quest series and how Dragon Quest Builders was born from it. Let's shift gears and talk about the game itself and if it's any good. I should mention before that my experience with Dragon Quest is thorough, but my experience with sandbox games is pretty basic. 
So full disclosure, graphically, this looks just like Minecraft. In fact, I assumed this was developed in partnership with Minecraft's developer Mojang, similar to how Dragon Quest Heroes was developed with Koei Tecmo. But I was wrong. So I asked myself, how could Square Enix get away with ripping off Minecraft? The answer? Transparency with the Minecraft influence and drastic changes in the gameplay. Dragon Quest Builders plays more like a traditional video game, while Minecraft feels almost like model building software. In fact, if it weren't for the boxy visuals, I would compare Builders more to Dark Cloud, Animal Crossing, and Zelda. Hear me out. Much like Dark Cloud or even Act Razor, Builders is divided into two styles of gameplay, your action and your building sequences. Builders action and combat is akin to classic action RPGs such as older Zelda titles and the Gaia series. It has simple aim and swing your sword style of action, but not to a fault as you have much else to consider such as managing your HP, resources, hunger, and enemy patterns. In fact, I would compare the gameplay and graphics most to Cubivore on GameCube, especially when these gray blocks are coming after you. How's that for an obscure comparison? Then you have the building part, which mechanically is like Minecraft, but I would compare it more to a simulation game. I'm always moving around, trivial little trinkets in the houses, trying to boost my town's level, sort of like when I'm working on my Feng Shui in Animal Crossing. I'm not trying to contrast builders and Minecraft. At its core, you're still smashing blocks to collect resources used to build things. But the developers are right. This plays very differently from your usual sandbox game. The main difference is that Builders has structure. It takes the sandbox genre and combines it with linear gameplay in the form of tasks to complete to progress the story. Those tasks may be to collect resources, build new items and equipment, or create entire structures with certain elements in mind. Other less sandboxy tasks might be to explore and find new residents or defeat certain enemies. The resource management does get complicated later on because you get so many items with equally as many options of what to build with them. Thankfully, there is a button to sort them and you unlock the ability to access all of them on the fly early in the game. Builders, of course, connects to its title sake as well, Dragon Quest, but it doesn't play or look very much like a Dragon Quest game until you start to dive in. Overall, it's visually very different, but most of the characters and enemies are derived from the series and were again designed by Akira Toriyama. It's pretty fun to see them in action here. Many items and pretty much all the weapons and armor are straight from Dragon Quest as well. For example, you restore HP with medical herbs, return to towns using chimera wings, and some of the first weapons you craft are cypress sticks, oaken clubs, and copper swords. You also have to concern yourself with cooking food since you have a hunger meter, but I think that the added depth for this fits in nicely with the gameplay. The music is mostly remastered Dragon Quest classics, just as most of the spin-offs are, which serves as a constant and delightful reminder of what series this is. The story actually ties in nicely with the series and aligns specifically with Dragon Quest 1. It takes place after DQ1 and follows an alternate timeline as though the hero had failed and the Dragon Lord sent the world into darkness and distress. It may be simple, but I think the alternate timeline is actually pretty fun. It reminds me of Back to the Future or the Split Zelda timeline. But most importantly, it gets us back into the world of DQ1 and it's neat to revisit the cities that you may remember and notice the callbacks. You can customize the hero to a certain degree with their look and name, but more interesting is that you can change this at any time during the game from the title menu. It's your job as the hero to gradually rebuild all those cities which were destroyed by the Dragonlord and free Alfgard from his reign. It's estimated that the game will take about 40 hours to complete, but myself I'm finding it to take quite a bit longer. It's really going to depend on how much time you spend fine-tuning your structures. Adding to that completion time is when I find myself wondering, what am I supposed to do now? New game mechanics like farming and taking care of sick townsfolk left me with questions early on about why what I was doing wasn't working. Additional clarifications would have been beneficial. If it's the building you're really into, there is a free build mode called Terra Incognita. Here you can upload your structures online as well as download other players' creations. The script is too long as usual, but well written and often genuinely funny. There is a lot of humor that is both in the story that is played and overall in the fact that the hero is the only one who knows how to build, said Fujimoto at PAX West 2016. Take this Hammerhood for instance. 
He's pretty concerned about us inquiring about his tool. T for teen and Dean. Duh. Indeed. Exploration is fun with a good variety of landscapes, but I wish there was a way to quick travel to more locations. I often find myself retraversing areas to get back to someplace out of the way that I've already been. You can zoom out to see more of your surroundings, but maps of each location would have been a welcome addition. Always be ready to build rooms to sleep in on the fly so you don't have to return to base which will cut back on travel time. This will also save you from traveling at night which should be avoided whenever possible. It's too dark to see anything and the enemies become extremely annoying. It's hard to know who to recommend Dragon Quest Builders to because I've really never played anything like it before. I did find it very accessible, extremely addicting, and I think that most other gamers would find it that way too. I would say having a pre-established enjoyment for Dragon Quest in general is the first criteria. It may not play quite like a Dragon Quest, but it's still strongly connected to the series. If you enjoy any kind of simulation game such as Civilization, The Sims, Roller Coaster, Tycoon, or even Animal Crossing, you'll probably find enjoyment here as well. The devil is in the details, and you'll need to have a good time managing resources and creating structures as these are major components of the game. If you're looking for a deep RPG experience, you won't find it here. Be prepared for simplified RPG mechanics and a light-hearted, albeit lengthy, script. And finally, be ready for a longer game, as it's expected to take at least 40 hours to play and the average player will see far more than that tick away as they lose themselves in their creations. Although there initially weren't plans for a sequel, good sales and fan feedback did lead to one being developed. On December 20th, 2018, Dragon Quest Builders 2 came out in Japan and a North American release followed on July 12th, 2019. As stated by Fujimoto, there are things in Builders 1 that the dev team wishes they would have had a chance to do differently. And now that I've had a chance to play Builders 2, does it improve upon that established formula to address those concerns? To wrap up, Let's talk about some key new features in Builders 2 that fans of the original will be interested in. Very quick backstory. Square Enix did enlist Koei Tecmo's Omega Force Studio to develop the sequel instead of doing it all in-house. Rather than using the first game as a framework and since Builders 2 wouldn't be on Vita or PS3, they decided to use a new game engine entirely. Bringing it to new platforms gave us more opportunities as we wanted to build a new system for the game altogether, said Nino to Variety in 2019. As far as gameplay goes, there is a slew of new features and quality of life improvements. We're now treated to alternate means of transportation like riding a saber cat, there is a run button, and we can fast travel! We can carry quantities greater than 99 items per slot, move objects without breaking them down and recollecting them, cut objects in half, weapons don't break, there's a map, the list goes on and they're all very welcome. A greater focus has been placed on exploration and the world of Builders 2 feels larger and more open than its predecessor. That world is full of interesting places to explore, full of puzzles and combat, and they feel more like traditional Dragon Quest dungeons. Changes to the mechanics for cooking and farming have been implemented, Farming, for instance, feels more like Harvest Moon now, and the townsfolk actually help out, which makes it a lot less arduous. In fact, the NPCs help out a lot more in general. The cooking change is unfortunately more time-consuming now, at least so far, and along with the paragliding and a few other aspects, seem to be blatantly borrowed from Breath of the Wild. Not that that's a bad thing. Combat is one aspect that did not change much. This was a missed opportunity as it would have been fun to see aspects of the core Dragon Quest games such as spells, skills, or classes implemented. But given that this was developed by Omega Force, the studio behind Dynasty Warriors, it's not surprising to see hack and slash combat. Much as the first Builder's story is based off of Dragon Quest 1, Builder's 2's story takes place after Dragon Quest 2. And there is still a ton of dialogue. So much of it is unnecessary too. Dragon Quest games in general have been becoming more and more text-heavy, and I know that story is important and I love the Dragon Quest stories, but I still think that they would benefit from being more to the point. We're given a permanent party member, which is nice, he's always following us around and helping collect resources, but there's more to him than meets the eye. 
multiplayer mode has been added too, but it's unfortunately not unlocked until you beat the first island, and equally unfortunate that it's limited to the free build area and it's only online. It does not support local split screen or co-op for the main story. And finally, if you played the OG Dragon Quest builders and have a save file on your console, you will get a few bonuses unlocked when you play Builders 2. I understand that you'll also be able to transfer some of the save data from 1 to 2. I don't get to take advantage of any of this though because I own 1 on the PS4 and 2 on the Switch. So, does Builders 2 improve on where Builders 1 falls short? Absolutely. The quality of life changes are undeniably an improvement, but I don't think that that necessarily makes 2 a better game. And ultimately, which one you prefer is going to depend on your own taste. They both are hybrid sandbox RPGs, but Builders 1 skews toward the sandbox side while 2 skews more toward the RPG side. Will we see a Dragon Quest Builders 3? We'll have to wait and see how Builders 2 does, hopefully well, as it's been getting great reviews. I hope we see a third because there is a lot of opportunity to build on the formula and potential to grow in the series. If there is, I hope it's based on the Merchant Town from Dragon Quest 3 and ties into that game, arguably the best in the whole series and probably my personal favorite. So there you have it. Let me know in the comments your thoughts on Dragon Quest Builders 1 and 2 and on this video. As always, thanks for watching and thanks for your support. Creative Games is brought to you by viewers like you. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and remember that in video games and in general, variety is the spice of life.